It was last night that young Letitia was seen for the last time. Around 9 p.m., she left the Bertry Sports Center and told a friend that she was going home. Letitia only lives a few hundred meters away, but she will never arrive at the family home. Is running away possible? Not in my opinion. No, she's not the type of girl that would run away. Always around with the kids, right? Not for me. What if they took her away? Yes, she was taken. Marc Dutroux. We discover his face on 15th August 1996 in the heart of summer, on the front page of all the newspapers and TVs in Europe. Since then, this face has embodied evil, horror, the monster. The one accused of kidnapping six children and teenagers, rape them and killing four of them. But who knows if there weren't more victims. The Dutroux affair almost caused Belgium to explode, and even today, we fear that this man was protected by the courts, that he had complicity at the highest level of the state. In the Dutroux affair, the worst perhaps remains to be discovered. They're alive, they're hidden somewhere, and they're probably being abused. Mark Dutroux breaks down and says to Prosecutor Burlett, I'm going to give you two of the girls. Just the fact of locking a child in this place. Assuming it was only 10 minutes, it is humanly monstrous. There is a pedophilia ring somewhere, which, unfortunately, becomes almost the only chance for them that their little girl is still alive. But ultimately, only Dutroux knows the truth. This is where it all begins, in grasse Olonne, in the suburbs of Liège, 150 kilometers from the French border. It was June 24th, 1995, a beautiful summer day. At the beginning of the holidays, Melissa is playing in her garden with her friend Julie. They are both the same age, eight years old. Around 5 p.m., the two girls ask for permission to go near the highway bridge, the one that connects Liège to Brussels. They will say hello to the cars as they do from time to time. But this time, they don't come back and Corinne, Melissa's mother, warns her whole family. Corinne called on Saturday evening. I believe it must have been around 6.30, 7 o'clock, something like that. It's Michel, my husband, who picks up and Corinne explains that Melissa went for a walk with Julie and she hasn't come back and she was worried. Corinne knew very well where Melissa was going for a walk or at least part of the way. So she went where Melissa said she was going and she didn't find anything. So it didn't look like Melissa at all and she was alerted immediately. It was worrying for her from the start. A quarter of an hour later, the policemen are on site and they retrace the supposed route of the girls. Without result, Julie and Melissa disappeared without a trace. But the investigators reassured. For them, it's just a runaway. The parents didn't believe it. When the investigators suggested that it was more of a runaway, it was a categorical no. No way, never, never, never. This is an offense to us. For the parents, it was. It's impossible, inconceivable. It was an insult, really. It felt like an insult to tell them that Melissa or Julie could have run away. 
They had a good life. They were well off. They were planning a party for the school. They sang. They danced. They were smiling, pleasant. Faced with the passivity of the police, the parents reacted. The same evening, they contacted the Mark and Corinne Association, which specializes in searching for missing children. Immediately, the president of the association set up a major poster campaign to collect testimonies. We worked all night printing posters with a photocopier at the time to probe the territory on which it was necessary to display. We called around 3 to 4 a.m. to several family members, friends, asking if they could be there around 5 to 6 a.m. to start putting up the first posters in a fairly close area initially. In two days, a network of volunteers was set up. 25,000 posters covered the entire country, on walls, on cars, in newspapers, no one in Belgium is unaware that two little girls named Julie and Melissa have disappeared. Without being able to imagine that they will both become the symbol of an affair that will shake the kingdom on its foundations. From the start, journalist José Dessar and Léon Michaud, who host the program Fates Divers, very well known on Belgian TV, are interested in the disappearance of the two little girls. They sense that something is wrong, and they meet the parents. What do they think of the investigation? What do they tell you about the work done by the police officers? Let's say that indeed the gendarmerie arrived quite quickly the same evening on the scene, but in dispersed order and without coordination, meaning there is no security perimeter. They use tracking dogs, but they don't start from the house. They take them directly from the bridge to where the little ones said they wanted to go. There is no raid by the public prosecutor's office first, then no raid by the lab, by the criminal investigation department. They don't collect micro traces in the children's room. They don't tell the parents about not entering the room, so as not to disturb and damage the micro traces. Therefore, parents must organize the first hunts themselves. They don't know how to control everyone. At their place, people come and go, and perhaps destroy traces. All of this completely lacks awareness of the importance of what needs to be done at this time. When there's a kidnapping, the police react in a completely different way. What do the police think? There were things that surprised them. For example, they had to lend a mobile phone because the police didn't have one. They laughed. They thought it was really... Well, it wasn't like in the movies. It was really amateurish and under-equipped. As if, ultimately, this affair was a simple matter of routine. Perhaps at the beginning it was considered a routine affair, since you know that we immediately think of running away in these cases, and we always said, well, they will be back tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. The problem, of course, is that if they don't come back, the first hours were lost. That might be an explanation, though. It could be a runaway by the time they arrive. So why take all these precautions? Yes, but even a runaway for eight-year-olds, do you realize? Eight-year-old children, all alone on a road and who ran away. They are in danger. We therefore need another reaction for everything that concerns the disappearance of children. Society really needs to become aware of this. From the first days, thanks to the display, testimonies poured in from all over the country. The policemen ask families to write down anything that seems strange and unusual to them. Every morning, we met at 9 a.m. with the investigators and we gave them the information, the intelligence that we had gathered. We kept a copy for ourselves and sent a copy to the investigators. A hard work. Parents even go so far as to note the number of all the cars that pass in the neighborhood. At the end of August, two months after the kidnappings, the policemen tell them that they have a clue. A man was reportedly seen near the bridge. They have a robot portrait whose diffusion does nothing. And then slowly, doubt sets in. What if the policemen had already given up hope of finding the little girls alive? It was at that moment that the journalist Michel Bouffieu became the family's confidant. He witnesses the first clashes between the parents and the investigators. 
During this period, I met Julie and Melissa's parents several times. And I remember one meeting in particular. One evening I arrived at their house. There was an investigator who was there, someone from the Liège Judicial Police. I remember that this person was a little mocking in relation to certain hypotheses which were mentioned by Julie and Melissa's parents, who were convinced that their children were alive. And it was very clear that at the level of the investigation, of the judicial authorities in general, we were following a completely different logic. We thought we had a priori that these children must have died on the very day of their kidnapping. Or very shortly after, and the investigation did not present the same degree of urgency. It looked like they were looking for bodies. And first they looked for culprits. And there, we disagreed with them because we were looking for the little ones and we were convinced that they were alive. We were looking for Julie and Melissa alive while they were looking for the culprits. And there really was a gap there. We couldn't agree on that level. We felt that there was a gap between them and between us. It's misunderstanding. The families discover that the investigation may be the victim of police rivalries. We realized that there were tensions between the investigators. On the one hand, there was the policeman. On the other hand, the municipal police. There was the BSN, the Special Research Brigade, and then there was the Public Prosecutor's Office. And we realized that. When we gave the information to one, the others did not have it. Whereas logically, we had a meeting very early on and an investigator, an ABSC agent, explained to us that we centralize everything, but we obviously work together in Liège to supervise the affair. Outro, the judge, appointed a man from the investigation department, Commissioner Lamoc, but on the ground was the gendarmerie who lead the investigation. This rivalry between the police and the gendarmerie is one of the keys to the Dutro affair. It will have dramatic consequences. For their part, the families are asking the judge for access to the file. Judge Martin Dutro refuses it to them. The investigating judge never wanted to communicate the slightest information to the parents of Julie and Melissa. And very quickly it turned sour. With remarks like, you know, this is not my only file. I have a lot of work. But the parents insist. And at the end of the summer, the judge finally received them. One day, the investigating judge said to them, well, you want to know what type of information is in this file? Well, I'll give you an example. She read a letter that had been sent by an anonymous witness and which described the circumstances in which Julie and Melissa supposedly died. And therefore, how the bodies had been mutilated, how they had been raped, etc. We know today that it was wind, that it was a false trail. But therefore, the only document that was revealed by the investigating judge at the time to Julie Millet's parents was a document of this type to discuss them. On one side, families, on the other, justice. The dialogue is broken. So, on 13th September 1995, the parents decided to alert public opinion in the famous television show by José Dossard and Léon Michaud. What are you waiting for now? Actually what? Is this file considered a priority file, and is it necessary to have a minimum of information on the file? On the status of the investigation? On a besoin de réponse, on a besoin de participer. Nous autres, c'est nos filles. C'est pas les filles à l'État, c'est pas les filles de l'instruction, c'est nos filles. What makes a national TV show interested in what could be a little news item for the local area? The disappearance of two little girls. Léon Michaud. 
We need to get back into the mindset of the times. The little girls disappear in June. It lasts two months, two and a half, three months. I think the matter is gaining momentum in public opinion, if you like. I also think that public opinion, after three months, thinks they are dead, because there are no clues. We no longer talk about anything. In the press, the investigators don't let anything leak. Parents are not kept informed of any investigative duties. And so we have the impression, if you like, that it's over. And then, well, we say to ourselves all the same, we cannot stay in a state of mind like that. We must try to understand why there is this silence, ultimately. Hence our idea of putting the parents on one side. And on the other side, the representatives of the police and the representatives of justice. When you meet Julie and Melissa's parents, what state of mind are they in? There is something quite extraordinary which shines through in the preparation of this program and in this program itself. In the debate, it is that there is a deep conviction among parents which will, I think, take everything away. A deep conviction. Our little girls are alive. They're alive, they're hidden somewhere, and they're probably being abused. Let's stay on the pre-show, is that what they tell you? That's it. If they make this show, it's because they strongly believe that this show will help find their little girls alive. Please give us access to the files so we can help you. But where do they get this conviction from? Is it just a hunch? It is a conviction that is ingrained in them, which will obviously be accurate, including in the terms of suffering that have been endured. It is a conviction that is anchored to their body, which I think allows them to hold on, and which implies, if you like, implicitly as a hypothesis, the idea that there is somewhere a pedophilia network which, unfortunately, becomes almost the only chance for them that their little girls are still alive. If it's an isolated predator, crazy, sick, he killed them. If it's a network, they are obvious hypothesis, which is terrible. At the same time, imagine that the only condition for them to be alive is that they are in a pit network. It's terrible, but they are ready to take on that. When we obviously look at these images so many years later, there is one thing that is not obvious, but that we know now, and that is that when you are all there on set, the kids are alive. Yes, the parents' belief turned out to be correct. They will probably live for several more months after that. This program on Belgian television annoys investigators who criticize the families for talking too much to journalists. The investigators, the judge, raised this argument since you work with the media, since you talk about it too much, etc. Since there are public interventions, well, we won't tell you anything. But anyway, they didn't say anything before. So, it was really them. It was their excuse to give even less. Investigators will no longer say anything to the families. Don't the families know? It's because at the same time, in the greatest secrecy, the gendarmerie has the name of a suspect. A certain Marc Dutroux. They will take it much later, much too late. Two months after the disappearance of Julie and Melissa, on the other side of the country, two other young girls disappear. Their names are Anne and Ephew. And they are just of legal age. They spend their vacation on the coast in Ostend with a few friends. In August 1995, they rented a bungalow. On August 22nd, Anne and Effie went alone by tram to the Middlekirk Casino on the other side of Ostend. They have tickets for a hypnosis show. During the show, they are invited on stage. On the video shot that evening, we can see a few in a tank top and Anne dressed in yellow, hypnotized by the magician. After the show, instead of going straight back, the two young girls wander around the casino, as we see on the video surveillance. When they come out, it is almost midnight. They then take the last tram, which stops in Ostend, that is to say halfway. Arriving at the terminus, they are seen one last time near the station. 
At this point, it is more than one in the morning. A few moments later, Anne and Effio disappear. The next day, warned by friends who did not see them return to the bungalow, Anne's father alerts the local police, but the mocking police refuse to register the complaint. They laugh a little. They say that here there are a lot of disappearances. And definitely they're in a bed with a boy somewhere. They told you that? Yes. They said that to friends too. And friends responded at that moment immediately. They answered, but it's not possible because they both have a boyfriend. They wouldn't do anything like that. And the police replied, I'm married. And he laughed. He meant it's possible. It's only September 6, 15 days later, that an investigating judge is finally appointed, almost by chance. The policemen or investigators wanted to wiretap from Mr. Marshall's station to record a possible significant call. And when he said yes, that goes without saying, why not? Well, I'm a little surprised, but why not? If it helps, yes. But then they added, will it be at your expense? He said, yes, but you shouldn't laugh. You're pushing the envelope. Why will it be at my expense? Because otherwise, you must appoint an investigating judge. So he said, appoint one. The police are questioning some witnesses. The dunes are raked in vain. Two months have passed since the disappearance of Julie and Melissa, and no one has yet made the connection between the two cases. At that time, no one made the connection, at least at the media level. Between these successive disappearances. The police won't make the connection either. The investigation gets bogged down and the disappearance of Anne and Effu is forgotten. Dominique Rizet, what happens next? Nothing more happens. Both investigations are at such a standstill that Julie and Melissa's parents will meet Anne's parents at Christmas to take stock of the cases of their children's disappearances. And these three families will see each time that they are held totally outside the information collected by the policemen and the courts. And then there will be a fifth disappearance a 11-year-old girl, Sabine Dardenne, who also disappears without a trace. No trace. She leaves for school at 7.30 in the morning. Neither her bicycle, a big bicycle, nor her school bag will be found. And there the police will not have the presence of mind to go and look for. Someone who could move around in a van, which seems more convenient for taking away a bicycle. Not much will happen, and we will have to wait for the disappearance of a sixth young girl named Laetitia for all these investigations to finally progress. Little Laetitia, 14 years old, has not been seen since yesterday evening as she left the swimming pool at the Bertry Sports Complex with one of her friends. The parents began the search alone before approaching the gendarmerie, but the searches undertaken so far have still not made it possible to find any trace of the young girl. Investigators seem to favor the hypothesis of a kidnapping rather than that of a runaway. Olivier Nederland. It was last night that young Letitia was seen for the last time. Around 9 p.m., she left the Bertree Sports Center and told a friend that she was going home. Letitia only lives a few hundred meters away, but she will never arrive at the family home. Is running away possible? Not in my opinion. No, she's not the type of girl that would run away. Always around with the kids, right? Not for me. What if they took her away? Yes, she was taken. Letitia disappeared like the others, but things happen very quickly, much faster than in previous disappearances. The next day, the case was handed over to the courts, to Prosecutor Borlet and Judge Conroth of Neuchâtel. These two men will become the heroes of all Belgium. From the outset, Borlet and Conroth pulled out all the stops. They take this disappearance very seriously. Unfortunately, we would have favored a path that would take into account. 
tient avec compte d'une a disappearance following the murder of the child, but it is certainly not established. That's what is alarming. We are not neglecting anything, but unfortunately, I think I can say that for the moment. The FUP track is absolutely not to be taken into consideration for the moment. The next day, the police launched a call for volunteers to comb the region. More than 400 people showed up and immediately got to work. Philippe Collin, a local journalist, was with them. Both days, Saturday and Sunday, people gathered again. Everyone will contribute their part to the search. Beats are organized. A helicopter flies over the Vertrige region. Michel Bourlet comes to the scene at the weekend. He doesn't want to let things drag on. It's very, very clear. It goes quickly and it's quite successful. At the end of the weekend, two days after Letitia's kidnapping, the police are on a trail. It was the neighborhood survey carried out by the investigators during the weekend and at the beginning of the week which made it possible to meet a young man who was 22 years old at the time who said he remembered well. Indeed, on Friday afternoon, there was a white van which was parked not far from the sports complex, at least from the swimming pool, and the individual who was on board seemed suspicious to me. He seemed to be waiting for someone. What is this young man doing? He will note the license plate number. He only remembers the first three letters. But with the description of the van, it's enough to identify a suspect. And the suspect's name is Dutro. Marc Dutro. Dutro lives more than 100 kilometers from Bertrix, in Charleroi, in the center of Belgium. Officially, he is a simple scrap dealer, but investigators discover that he has a very busy past. He has already been convicted of rape of a minor. The same evening, Dutro was arrested. In the company of his wife, Michel Martin, and a young man, Michel Lelevre. Four days after the kidnapping, the police found Dutro at home. The suspicious van, but no traces of Laetitia. Prosecutor Burlet makes the decision to thoroughly analyze and examine. Dutroux's van. The expertise reveals two things. This van, the engine, has been running very recently. First of all, and second, a police dog is brought. He was made to sniff the underwear or clothing of the girl who had been kidnapped. And as soon as he enters Dutroux's van, he begins to show that he indeed finds the smell. So we can be sure that Letitia was kidnapped in this van. But Dutroux is in police custody and he is not breaking down. It is not him who kidnapped Letitia. Dutroux is going to acknowledge that he was indeed in Bertri on the day of the kidnapping. That he met this young girl, Letitia. But he will invent a whole scenario by saying that it was a young girl who was at odds with her family. That he tried to console her, etc. And that he let her go and then, well, he came home. The police then changed strategy. They put pressure on the young man arrested with Dutro. Michel Lavrif, because he has a weak point. He is a drug addict and deprived of his drugs. In the middle of a withdrawal crisis, he admits to the kidnapping of Laetitia and throws Marc Dutroux under the bus. And there, Dutroux can no longer deny. He did kidnap Laetitia. But to the surprise of the investigators, it doesn't stop there. The first earthquake is here. At a certain point, Marc Dutroux breaks down and says to Prosecutor Burlet, I'm going to give you two girls. The second is Sabine Dardenne, the one who had disappeared in Tournai two months earlier. The investigators immediately returned to Dutroux. And a few hours later... It's an immense pleasure. 
to announce to you that we have not only found Letitia, but also Sabine. It was obviously a huge surprise, but the joy in life is all the greater. While in Liège, the investigation into the disappearance of Julie and Melissa has been stalling for more than a year, here in New Chateau. Borle and Conroth only took six days to find Letitia and Sabine. This Thursday, August 15, 1996, the return of the girls to their family takes place in an atmosphere of popular jubilation. That evening, Belgium celebrated the end of the nightmare. We hope this doesn't happen again. Nobody yet suspects that the Dutro affair is only just beginning. Vincent de Croly was a deputy in Belgium. He tried to understand the dysfunctions of the Dutro affair. Vincent de Croly, I am speaking both to the former MP that you are and to the Belgian citizens. According to you, why, after so many failures and so much delay this time, we managed to free the girls in time. To succeed in this, it was necessary to have motivated magistrates who took their mission seriously. And undoubtedly, I believe that Michel was tormented for a few minutes. Maximum a few hours after the first call, was on the scene, felt what was happening, met the parents. Questioned by a magistrate who did not wait, who did not stay in his office, who was keen to delve into the affair, into its environment, into the places where it happened, to meet the main interested people. It was a strong intuition that he had from the start and which was probably the source of the results that followed. Is this a story about men? Inevitably. I think there is a dimension. Professional conscience of inflexibility on the part of Brulet and Conroth, which made it possible to achieve these results. Because even when arriving at Marc Dutrick's, it was not certain that he would find the children. Between us, didn't they shake him up a little? Did you confess to Dutro's interrogation? I don't know how it happened in practice. That's not the version they gave us, not necessarily. But I think there was strong psychological pressure on him to take him down one by one and quickly, without waiting. The various alibi he put forward between August 13th and 15th. He claimed he did not use the suspect vehicle. Well, we proceeded immediately and directly to a technical analysis of the vehicle. And an hour later, that he tried to make this argument. It was quickly proven to him that this was not the case. And so on, for different elements, which he put forward to try to escape prosecution. So much so that, at one point, I think he is completely stuck, pushed into the corner psychologically by magistrates who had clearly made him feel that he would not give up. He felt the need to regain control, to regain the initiative. By conceding to them that he was going to show them something, that he had someone to deliver to them. Belgium celebrates the release of Sabine and Laetitia and the arrest of Dutro. It will discover what was happening in the basement where they were held. They really are walled up living people, these young girls. One trembles when thinking about their condition, that of Laetitia Delhez for a few days, but still, over two months, I believe, for Sabine Dardenne. The two girls were locked in the cellar of Dutroux's house in Marcinelle, and the system for accessing their dungeon was Machiavellian. So much so that it is Dutroux himself who will have to reveal the secret passage to the police. The entrance to the three square meter cubbyhole was hidden behind this metal shelf. A heavy sliding door of the same thickness as the wall. Impossible to detect. Behind this totally airtight door, the victim's cell. The girls were locked up, together. The police find comics, games, but also contraceptive tablets. 
From the outside, it's impossible to suspect the existence of the hiding place. The air duct is hidden in chimneys and the electricity is hacked from another meter. The system is diabolical, completely undetectable. With the police, Sabine and Letitia recount their ordeal. Fear, confinement, but above all the repeated rapes. Above, in the house, there was the entire Dutru family. His wife, his three children, who will say they never noticed anything. And yet every day, Dutro went down to the cellar. Descendez dans la cave. You, Mr. Rivière, are Sabine's lawyer. L'avocat Sabine. You went down into the cellar? Yes. I saw it in March 1997. I went there with her parents and her two sisters. Did the parents want to see it? The authorities suggested that the parents go see it. They wanted to see it to find out. We realized something that we could never have imagined if we had seen it with our own eyes. That's to say. It's terrible. Sabine's dad's reaction was that I wouldn't put my dog in there. It was absolutely terrible, even for professionals. I am a professional. We were accompanied by gendarmerie officers who saw many not very pleasant things. Finally, we saw walls, a hole in a wall. Imagine what happened. One could put one and several little girls there. We also know that two almost died there. It's terrible. What does Sabine say about how things were going in the cellar? What she says is that at first she only saw Marc Dutrecht. And that when Marc Dutrex was absent, he put her in the cellar. And when Marc Dutrex returned, he took her out of the cellar. And she could then move freely, quote unquote, in the house. And in the cellar, she was alone then? Yes, she was always alone until Letitia arrived. What was she doing in the cellar? What was in there? She had her school things. She therefore had the opportunity, throughout her detention, to keep a notebook which she keeps day after day. And where it indicates, by coded signs elsewhere, what is happening. She puts small circles when Dutrex comes. By come, you will understand what that means. Some of these small circles are accompanied by stars. She explained to investigators that these stars, which go from one to three, correspond to the degree of pain she felt when Dutrex abused her. Day after day. She also indicates in this notebook, today is normally Boban's birthday. Well, today, her mother is a nurse and works in shifts. I think that mother is working. There was always in this notebook also a reference to what her life would have been like if she had been at home. But above all, there are also these circles when Dutrex comes and these stars, depending on the pain felt by this little girl of 12 and a half years old. You can't make it up. But in addition to rape, there is real psychological torture. Dutru, in order to enslave his victims, always makes them believe that he is only the instrument of a mysterious gang whose leader wants to obtain money from their parents. He also made them write letters to this effect. Obviously, these letters were never sent and this allowed him to manipulate them psychologically. Because he answers, he said, listen there, your parents didn't answer. I went to see them. You know they don't seem very worried about the fact that you left. Because, well, they put up the swimming pool and they invited the little neighbors to come in the water and all that. And, well, all sorts of things of this nature. Well, since the parents don't pay, the boss wants to kill the children. The only way for the children to survive is to be nice to Mark. Dutroux appears. The persuaders hide, even if they hear a noise. So as not to arouse, he says, the suspicions of his accomplices. They believe it. They obey until the moment of their release. Maître Bautier, you are Letitia's lawyer. What does she say about her short stay in the cellar? She recounts what she experienced during those days when a rapist, her kind of mentor. You know that they were, even Letitia, after four days, in a state of dependence such that when the prosecutor arrived, 
qu'au moment où le procureur est arrivé devant In front of this open door, they didn't want to follow him. They asked Dutrix what they should do. So, even in four and a half days, Sabine stayed longer, but in four and a half days, the system was so well established that everyone knows who frequents places of prostitution. We first forced the girl to, through fear, find a leader to whom she will obey. And in four days, Laetitia is dependent on Dutro. Yes, because in four days he raped her. In four days he did the most terrible things to her. Sabine told her what she has suffered. For four days she believes, like any human being, that there is a candle that will shine somewhere, and it is Dutrex, because he tells him so. He tells her, I am the nicest. Above there is a more disgusting leader. And so this child will believe that the only possible avenue is perhaps to be nice to Dutrex. Because otherwise, it's worse. But excuse me, I don't know what's worse than what Sabine experienced, what Letitia experienced. I believe that they will obviously be damaged forever because what he did to them. What the Assize Court will see, what the jurors will see, what the public will see, for me is unbearable. I cannot read this folder. And I believe that no one can read this file without being taken, frankly, without comedy, sometimes. A kind of rage to say to oneself that it's not possible, it's not humanly possible that someone, someone, a few, did that. Among the population, these revelations provoke anger. Especially when Marc Dutro appears for the first time in public outside the Neuchâtel courthouse. La sortie du palais de justice de Neuchâtel. On August 10th, Dutroux, under pressure from the police, made another revelation. Julie and Melissa, it was also him. And the bodies are buried in one of these houses, three meters underground. The two little girls that all of Belgium searched for for more than a year died of starvation five months earlier. And indeed, the bodies are there, underground. And next to it, another corpse, an adult. The body of Bernard Weinstein, a former accomplice, undoubtedly murdered by Dutro. But Dutro doesn't stop. Three days later, he and the hare confess to the kidnapping of Anne and a few. So they start digging again in the garden of his accomplice Weinstein, and they find two buried bodies. The girls had been dead for almost a year. I think there is a sort of state of shock in this country. When we showed these images of these children coming out of the cage, then after we said we had found Julie and Melissa, buried like in Dutroux's garden, and then after we discovered that Anne and Effio, their bones had been placed under a concrete slab near the home of an accomplice of Dutroux's. I think we can speak of a state of shock. On August 22nd, in Liège, the Belgians gathered behind the parents of Julie and Melissa. Television organizes the funerals of the two little girls, broadcast live. During the funeral, the entire country observes a minute of silence. So now we have to answer this question. A traumatized Belgium demands it. Who is this monster with a human face who kidnapped six girls and killed four? Marc Dutroux grew up in Obey, a small village in the suburbs of Charleroi. His parents are both teachers. 
His father, from a consanguineous marriage, suffers from serious psychiatric disorders. With Mark, his eldest son, he is very violent. In 1996, Professor Van Merbeek will have the opportunity to study the weight of the relationships between Dutru and his father. Et son père. His father is crazy, no doubt. Even if it took him a while to be taken into custody and sent to the psychiatry, his father was really crazy. That is to say that he is a man who had a kind of all-powerful relationship with his eldest son, in particular with the others, where it was he who made the law. So in general, the father guarantees the law, symbolizes the law, but the father does not make the law. The father Dutrix is someone who has always imposed his own pleasure, and in an extremely violent manner, humiliating, treating his children extremely violently, even sitting at his table. And I believe that with him in particular, he had a particularly violent and abusive relationship. Dutroux was 14 when his parents divorced. He then lives with his mother who has moved back in with a boy who is only three years older than him. At 17, he was expelled from college for trafficking in pornographic images. And there he leaves home and settles in Charleroi, a gray city, devastated by the decline of industries. Already he has a very strong sexual appetite. He multiplies his conquests, preferably very young. In 83, after a first marriage from which he had two children, Dutroux meets Michelle Martin, his future wife, and above all, his future accomplice. With her, he will have three other sons. Officially, he is a scrap dealer, but he makes his living mainly from car theft and petty trafficking. Traffic. He's a scrap dealer from a working class town. A scrap dealer who lives with his wife, who lives with her children in modest houses. And finally, he receives benefits from mutual insurance because he had some health difficulties and... He also lives from theft. Dutru is not a boss recognized in the community as being really intrusive. Not at all. He is a small, nothing thief who has no scope. With the money from this trafficking, he bought small houses, slums, six in total, located in working-class neighborhoods of Charleroi. This is where he stores the stolen items, but behind the delinquent is already the pervert. Nineteen eighty-five, Dutru is twenty-nine years old, and in one year, in the Charleroi region, he kidnaps and rapes five young girls. The oldest, Celine, is nineteen years old. The youngest, Lawrence, is only eleven years old, and he already has a technique. June eighth, eighty-five, for example, end of the day, Lawrence comes out of the swimming pool in Jilly near Charleroi. In the parking lot, Dutro, accompanied by an accomplice, spotted his prey. Lawrence got angry with her friends. She goes home alone. They follow her by car, and when they reach her, they kidnap her and stick plaster over her eyes. Then they take her to an abandoned garage. Dutro rapes her and forces her to pose for pornographic photos. Jean-Jacques Weiser was Lawrence's lawyer. Even today, he remains marked by Dutroux's cynicism. After the rape, he hesitates and several times. He discusses with the accomplices who joined him or who are in a room next to the one where he carried out the rape to find out if the victim was able to see him. Was able to measure by clues to where she had been transported. And he will sometimes discuss openly with a 12 year old child whether they are going to kill her or not, because she might have seen what was happening. But at the time, Dutrix each time made the decision not to kill, but to abandon the young girl near where she was kidnapped and each time with this rather horrible approach. In the case of the youngest, 
he would give her candy. In the case of an older girl, and both were deflowered, he would give her some change and tell her to go to the doctor. In total, Dutru committed five rapes before being denounced by his accomplice. But during the trial, he absolutely denied the facts. It gives the impression to all those who participated at this first trial to be a truly, totally cynical being. Contemptuous of the life of others, contemptuous of the person of others, and much more concerned about his situation and the problems he feels in his situation than about the seriousness of the facts. And these are facts which mark and which allow, 10 years, 20 years later, to say to ourselves that we had the feeling of encountering a form of absolute horror. Finally, Marc Dutroux is sentenced to the maximum sentence. 10 years in prison. In detention, he wrote dozens of letters to judges and his lawyers. He poses as a victim, an unjustly condemned victim. So after six years in prison, he was released, despite the advice of the prosecutor who remained horrified by the seriousness of the facts. Maitre Niquez was Marc Dutroux's lawyer at the time. The Ministry of Justice, depending on the seriousness of the facts, or the less serious nature of certain facts, increased the detention to almost half of the sentence. And so I would say that his case was followed, as were all the cases at that time, without treatment or favor. Neither, I'd say particularly severe treatment towards him. It was, for this type of case, a normal outcome and course. Dutroux is free. And from his first conviction, he will remember that victims must never be left alive. Laissez de victimes vivantes. Here we are in 1992. Dutroux was convicted for his first rapes. He served part of his sentence. He is released on parole. Mm -hmm. He will kidnap Julie and Melissa in 1995, that is to say three years later. What will happen during these three years? Will he keep quiet? No. No. In fact, I think we can say that Marc Dutroux never really kept quiet. In 1992, he was released from prison. A few months later, in Charleroi, at the ice rink, he will engage in sexual touching of young girls. He is arrested by the police, questioned, and then they release him. Without worrying or trying to know a little more about the personality of this man. Isn't there anyone who makes the connection between his past and his groping at the pool? There is one person who knows, his attending physician. This doctor that Dutroux is supposed to see regularly since his release from prison. And his treating doctor knows about it, but he will not alert the legal authorities. He won't tell anyone. On this relapse? Nothing about this relapse. There might be an explanation for it. Later, it would be said that Dutroux spoke to him about the relentlessness of the police and gendarmerie against him. That they are angry with him. So did his doctor believe him? In any case, he doesn't warn anyone. Worse, he will even issue him a medical prescription and prescribe sedatives. That it then seems that Marc Dutroux is used to drug his future victims. Were these touches the only deviations from Dutroux during these three years? No. No. In 1992, the same year, that is to say it goes very quickly, he is arrested by the gendarmes who are working on a whole series of thefts committed in the region. And the gendarmes will go and search his houses and they discover that Dutroux is working on several cellars in several of his houses. 
The police ask him the question, why this work? And he answers quite naturally, I am renovating the basements of the houses I have bought. And it's amazing because the policemen who are in front of him, this person they know, whose file they have, who they know is a repeat pedophile, well, they won't even ask themselves the question of knowing. What is the purpose of this work that he carries out in the cellars? Dutroux, rapist identified and on file, was therefore able to do it again, and it is already a scandal. But that's nothing compared to what Belgium will learn 15 days after the release of Sabine and Letitia. From the first days of the investigation into the disappearance of Julie and Melissa, the policemen were already on Dutroux's trail. They could have saved them. Les sauver. From July 7, 95, less than 15 days after there, which is a definitive kidnapping. Even if we still don't know who committed it, the name of Dutrix leaves Charleroi towards the cell of Grassolon. This means that all the elements are in place, since Charleroi is indeed where he operates. And Grassolon, this is actually where we are looking for Juliette Melissa. Juliet and Melissa disappears on June 24th, and on 7 July 95, the Charleroi gendarme, discovering the disappearance notice, alerted their colleagues in Grasse Ologne by fax. They have a man on their list who has the profile of a kidnapper of little girls. His name is Marc Dutroux. And on the fax, the policemen mention Dutroux's previous conviction for rape. They also specify that since 93, a rumor has accused him of having set up his cellar to sequester children there. After reading the facts, the Grasse Ologne gendarme asked for details. And on August 4th, the Charleroi policemen sent a new fax with additional information. An informer allegedly informed them that Dutroux had asked him to help him kidnap children in exchange for 150,000 Belgian francs, approximately 4,000 euros. This informant is called Claude Thérault. I went to have a drink. Dutroux told me he was going to accompany me. We left there and coming back on the path, there were two young girls walking. They wandered off to the side. He turned off the headlights and said to me like this, since you have debts and all that, if you need money, I'll make it easy for you. If those girls are kidnapped, it brings in 100 and 150,000 francs. And I told him, no, I'm going to live in Faust. I don't do that to kids. And so, how should I say, suddenly, he got angry. He told me like, yeah, if she has, well, he complained. And I said like that, I don't do that. And then he said to me, but I'm going to show you how to do it. So he took me, he took his arm, he put it around my neck and with his hand over my mouth. He said, no, we put them in the car, they wouldn't be able to get out, child safe in cars here is in place, we'll knock them out if needed. I refused. The next day, I went to find the police. Logically, based on this information, the Grasse Olone gendarme could have arrested Dutroux a month and a half after the kidnapping of Julie and Melissa. Well, no, they keep it a secret. I try to put myself in the place of the investigators. I know several times that they have clear information. Dutroux is really the most important suspect. It's the only tangible thing they have. We know this guy has a background. I don't understand how we can go home at night and not thinking about doing everything possible to intervene as quickly as possible. So it's a little beyond me. And if the gendarmerie doesn't do anything, it's because they need a big blow. We are in a context not only of a police war, but also of restructuring projects for the police in Belgium. And so, the gendarmerie needs great success, wants great success. And somehow, finding a hole in the nose in the beard of the peg operators of Liege, that could really bring... How should I say, a lot of grist for the mill of the general staff of a gendarmerie. This is why the gendarmes decide to go alone, not to say anything to the police or to the investigating judges, and not to arrest Dutroux so as not to attract attention. Pas attirer l'attention. 
The gendarmes received information from Charles Leroy. Rather than giving them explicitly to the investigating judge, to obtain search warrants, for example, to go and see what was happening at Dutroux's house, they decided to carry out their investigation on their own. It's that the gendarmes will work among themselves and right away. From the abduction of Julie and Melissa, they will launch an operation they call by a non-code name, Otello, a parallel operation. So they relocate the investigation, which will no longer be conducted in Liege, but in Charleroi, by gendarmes working internally, without the cover of an examining magistrate. However, not being covered by an examining magistrate, they also deprive themselves of the means to act. They can't search. They cannot wiretap, seize letters, and seize people to arrest them and deprive them of their freedom. The incredible, the mind-blowing, the astonishing secret operation of the policeman, called Otello, begins on August 25th, two months after the disappearance of Julie and Melissa. Initially, they were limited to surveillance of Marc Dutroux's houses. What they do is position themselves around the Dutroux houses, and they observe Dutroux coming in and out of his house, coming in, going out, and there he is, he stays in front of the door. It's limited to that. They know that Dutroux usually goes out at night and keeps watch during the day. In fact, it is done against common sense. What were they waiting for? Let them walk down the street with Julie and Melissa at arm's length to catch it, right? It's probably a story like that, anyway, so it's completely ridiculous. It's ridiculous what happened there. It's shameful, obviously. Six times, the policeman hid in front of the Trow house without noticing anything. And yet, inside, there are Julie and Melissa alive. And as they saw nothing, in mid-October, the surveillance was abandoned. But on December 6th, the fate offered them a second chance. There is one of the policemen who worked as part of Operation Taylor, who works, finally, who goes to Jamu prison and sees that on the register of people who entered and left the prison, they see the name Dutroux, who was arrested. In early December 1995, Indeed, at the same time, Dutroux is in prison for a stolen truck event. This is the perfect opportunity to search his house. The gendarmes will use the pretext of theft to be able to search Marc Dutroux's house. Legally. So they divert a search warrant from its true purpose. They are using a search warrant that was executed under the pretext of investigating Dutroux for evidence related to the theft of the truck. However, their actual intention is to see if they can find any traces of the presence of the little girls or the little girls themselves. Who knows? On December 12, 1995, the policemen finally search Marcinelle's house. In the cellar, they don't notice anything. However, they pass right by the hiding place where Julie and Melissa have been locked up for more than five months. A week later, another pretext search, and that day, in the house... Chief Warrant Officer Michaud hears voices. This gendarme heard while he was there children murmuring. Today, we know that it was certainly Julie and Melissa that they were still alive at that time. So he heard them. And the time he heard these children's murmurs, he says, he said, be quiet, not towards the children, but towards his colleagues who were there in the floor. At this point, the voices stopped. Two things in one. Or he says to himself, well, they're here and I'll take a hammer and smash the whole mess, but I'll find them. He has no right to be here for that. Or he thinks maybe it's kids playing in the street. Chief Warrant Officer Michaud does nothing. And yet, in the house, he finds a gynecology instrument. 
chloroform in the videotape of a report on the disappearance of Julie and Melissa. This information is obviously not communicated to the investigating judge Martine Dutro. On July 25, 1996, the incredible Otello operation is suspended. When the situation was, I will say, elucidated or explained, we saw that there was really a failure of the entire system, both police and judicial, in the country. We only want justice. It's clear. We say to ourselves, if they had done their job properly, we wouldn't be there. It confirms what we said. We were right to say that they were hiding things from us. They knew and they didn't do it. Belgium betrayed by these gendarmes. Par ces gendarmes. What would you like to say to these police who, through their inconsistency, allowed two little girls to die? First, I would have a lot of questions to ask them, really a lot of questions. The main one being, you had a golden opportunity, practically on a platter. Two months at most after the abduction of Julie and Melissa to arrest the one who had kidnapped them. As early as August 96, you strongly suspected him of being behind this kidnapping. And then it took a year, other year, where you obviously beat around the bush before you took action. I don't understand. And I still don't understand. There is an explanation. The first is, there were dysfunctions in the gendarmerie at the time. And then there is a rivalry with the police. Does that satisfy you? There's definitely a component to that kind of rivalry factor. But precisely, the rivalry was supposed to stimulate them, lead them to stop Marc Dutrix and stop him much earlier, perhaps even to save Julie and Melissa. So the explanations based on rivalries have never convinced me more than half. There could be protections. Politics, people who tell the police, don't push any further, there's nothing to look for. This is one of the hypotheses on which we have a lot of questions in Belgium. You say political protection, maybe as a shortcut. The protections, they can be of different orders, including private, including police, judicial. And indeed, when you have, from a case, which here is a case of child abduction, elements of arms trafficking, elements of paper trafficking, elements of human trafficking, elements of car trafficking, luxury car trafficking, truck theft, all sorts of things like that. Well, there are indications there that we are not simply facing a little lost thug, but that there are perhaps behind or around him other people, other personalities. And something that is more systemic than criminality in the common sense of the term. Our simpler version is that the gendarmes wanted to push their advantage further, further, until they had certainties. And then one day, they go down to the cellar and they pull on the wrong piece of iron, which doesn't release the right door, which doesn't give them access to the girls. And then there it is, just human weakness. It had to be addressed, but 12 months is a bit long for such a serious weakness. 12 months is a bit long, especially since they will tell me that we had to catch him red-handed. That would have allowed us to close a stronger case, to have more compelling evidence. Yes, but precisely, after Julie and Melissa, Mark Dutrix and his accomplices have again carried out kidnappings. They kidnapped four more children or young girls after these two. And so, the opportunities, I will say that they have unfortunately multiplied. And in each case, once again, I must say that the scales have tipped in the wrong direction. Since the arrest of Marc Dutroux, Prosecutor Borlet and Judge Conroth collected the entire Dutroux file and placed around a hundred investigators at their disposal. The challenge is to know whether there are accomplices behind the monster. 
Everyone was looking for an explanation and want an exemplary punishment for the people responsible for this state of affairs. But also immediately, the idea was that it was not possible for something this horrible to happen without there being an organization behind it. Perhaps it was too simple to imagine that one person could behave like a monster. What if Dutru was just a pawn at the heart of a vast pedophile network? The question arises because four days after the arrest of Marc Dutru, Michel Nihoul, a 54-year-old from Brussels, is arrested. The police noticed that he made numerous phone calls to Dutro before and after Letitia's kidnapping. When questioned, he admitted having met Dutro through Michel Luliev, but he said, he had to repair my car. But when the Belgians discovered the sinister face of Michel Nihoul, For them, there is no doubt, this man is in charge of the job. Nihul, I think that it is rather the character or the face of this character that will be perceived by public opinion. What is this image? It is that of a man who has puffy features, who is unshaven. Someone who ultimately has just experienced hours and hours of interrogation. So who is not ready because Newell in life wears a suit and tie. And then we see an individual who is dirty and whose eyes some read Levi's. And this is a little like the first image we will have of Newell, which will thus be published and conveyed by the media. The photos shown of him at this time are particularly suited to the image we can have of an individual of this ilk. The offense of his appearance, it exists, and well, there it exists. In addition, Nioul was already convicted 20 years ago for fraud. And he has a sulfurous reputation. Right away, we know, because public rumor tells us that Niul is someone who has a full address book, therefore who frequents politicians, financiers, who is also someone who has participated in numerous orgies. Michel Niul always said, never denied, that he participated for a period, in his life only, during this period. In group sexual activities, he went to swinger clubs, etc. And of that, we say, yes, he met X, Y, and Z. He would probably answer you in my place that in these kinds of circumstances, you don't go around with a pack of business cards, but it's true that he knew people in the associative environment, he knew a lot of people in Brussels, both in business and politics. The famous orgies, Newell organizes them in this cafe which he bought in 1982, but also in this castle near Brussels. He could be the head of a pedophile network fueled by Marc Dutroux. The network thesis absolutely needs Michel Newell. If there is no Michel Newell, we have an isolated incident. Dutrix, the complicity of Livre, perhaps that of Michel Martin, and we stop there. The network hypothesis is only held by Michel Mule. If we take this one out, there is no more network. He is the only person who could play this role of link between the performers and a possible network. Since he perhaps had the possible clients due to his morals, since he perhaps had the possible protections, since they perhaps had the possible knowledge. A network. Belgian journalist Marie-Jean Van Eswijk is convinced that Dutro was not alone. From this conviction, she wrote a book. Marie-Jean Van Eswijk, you contributed to a work called The X Files. What are X Files? The X-Files with the names of the X-Witnesses, these are young women who, when Dutroux's affair broke, came to us to testify about a past of being victims of sexual abuse drawn into networks. They wanted to testify anonymously to protect their private lives, the lives they had managed to rebuild, and they were therefore called X-Witnesses. 
There were X1, X2 until X7, and there were also two men who came to testify. The first to come and testify has the code name X1. But since then, she has had a face and a name. Her name is... Regina Louf. What is Regina Louf talking about? She was entrusted to her grandmother on the Belgian coast when she was less than two years old. She lived with this grandmother until she was 11 years old. It was a house in which the grandmother rented rooms. And Regina Louf says that her grandmother prostituted her several times a week. And since then, no more childhood time. She then left the Belgian coast. She then went to live with her parents in the Gans region. And there for several years, she was under the control of a man much older than her who was already in his 40s at a time when she herself was 12 years old. What connects Regina Alouf's testimony to Dutroux's affair? Regina Alouf mentions the name of Michel Nihoul from the first audition she does in the file, saying that he was part of the circle of people who abused children. And she had dealings with him. And that she had dealings with him. Is Regina Alouf's testimony reliable? Because we said, this girl is crazy, this girl is crazy. What we can say about her is that she was the victim at a given moment, when her testimony came out publicly, of media relentlessness, media denunciations on a scale never seen before in Belgium. And indeed, it was in the media that people wrote that she was crazy. A magistrate has never said it, never an investigator has said it. I simply point out that in the case of Regina Louf, justice appointed a panel of five psychiatric experts who were responsible for examining her at some length and who concluded that she had been the victim of massive sexual abuse in her childhood. It was an established fact and that her testimony should be taken into account, that she was neither a mythomaniac nor a storyteller, nor that she wasn't fantasizing. All these testimonies therefore confirm the network trail. They confirm the network's trail. We know that there are camps in Belgium which are divided on this problem. One speaks of Marc Dutroux, his wife Michelle Martin, his accomplice Michelle Lelièvre, in a small nucleus which would act alone. I simply note that at the start of the investigation, it was these defendants themselves who spoke of a network. It is in their first testimonies that Michel Martin, as well as Michel Lelièvre, explained that Marc Dutroux did not kidnap children for himself, that Marc Dutroux acted on command, that girls had to have such and such characteristics, that Dutroux, explains Lelièvre, trained them at home so that they would be docile and then accept the client. You know, all these statements, they are in the file. Those who today discuss the thesis of the network or not of the network are engaged in an intellectual debate. Michel Nihoul is the head of a network. The idea is gaining ground in Belgian opinion. But who says network also says protection. The lack of timely intervention by the gendarmerie in relation to Dutroux can perhaps find a first explanation in the fact that Dutroux must have known people in judicial and police circles. And that he perhaps had the possibility of acting with relative impunity. That was really the feeling shared by everyone at that moment. Impunity, protection, but then who? For weeks, the media maintained a general climate of suspicion based on rumor. Every day, it's a revelation. The media rather played the role of agitator. They played the role of the fourth power which asserts itself. Which puts the other powers on the scene. The role of the media during the first part of the affair was to transform what should have remained a news item, tragic indeed, but a news item, as a social phenomenon and as an earthquake, as an earthquake for Belgium.
October 14, 1996, another thunderclap. Judge Conroth, a true hero in the eyes of the population, is withdrawn from the investigation. All this because of a photo published by the local newspaper after the release of Sabine Letitia. Here's the famous photo. The photo that earned Judge Conroth's dismissal. Absolutely. We also recognize him as Judge Jean-Marc Conroth. By his side, Prosecutor Michel Bourlet. They agreed to participate in a spaghetti, a spaghetti evening, to celebrate the reunion. In Bertry, it happens on a Saturday evening, and then a press correspondent is there for our future newspaper. He takes a photo. We publish this photo on Monday morning. But we are not yet asking the question of what this could entail. Did you imagine the consequences this photo would have? Absolutely not. And on Sunday evening, I was here on duty at the editorial office. We chose this shot with the editor-in-chief. And the next day, we blamed ourselves for not having asked the question ourselves. Meaning, a judge who investigates for the prosecution, but also for the defense? Can he be present at a dinner organized by future civil parties? And that is naturally the case here. Because it is true that originally, this dinner organized in support of Sabine and Laetitia was only a small local event seemingly very innocuous. But when Mark Dutroux's lawyer discovers this photo, he obviously sees this as a sign that Judge Conroth has lost his neutrality. One morning I found myself on the front page of a regional newspaper, the announcement that he had participated in a dinner whose profits, with Mr. Borlet, and in profit, were reserved to finance defense, defense of the interests of civil parties. In other words, an investigating judge who enhanced an evening with his presence ensured, given his popularity at the time, its success. Therefore the profitability and profits were allocated to the defense of civil parties. I reason like that. An investigating judge who contributed to my opponent's defense costs. That's inconceivable. My colleague Julian Pierre has made his decision. We have made it too. And we decided to make a request for legitimate suspicion, saying to ourselves that's it. The inspection judge Conrad no longer has the distance required to continue to conduct this investigation. When on October 14th, the Court of Cassation delivered its verdict, Belgians take to the streets to shout revolt. It is around 4 p.m. The five to 600 people gathered in front of the Brussels courthouse learn of the decision of the Court of Cassation. Boos, whistles, cries of hatred, the reactions are very strong. I would like to say that I find it petty and monstrous that a man was sold for a plate of spaghetti. In the minds of a lot of people here, she becomes an accomplice. And today, she comes. Justice, the one who is there to defend us, to make new victims, the parents. Because the crowd was also there to support the parents of the missing children, and when Anne Marchand's father came out of the courthouse, it was again a commotion. But then, the emotion. Justice has murdered a corrupt man. That's it. No, I would simply say that the Court of Cassation and Mrs. Lincoln Dowd are sort, incompetent or corrupt. That's all I'd say. With the withdrawal of Judge Conroth, families who have long fought against the judicial institution have the impression of losing their main ally. For me, that meant we wanted to stifle everything. Because Judge Conrad wanted to know everything. We can say that this will truly be the death knell for our hopes. Throughout Belgium, thousands of people demonstrate in support of Judge Conrad. Workers stop work. Students take to the streets. In Ghent, all the staff of the Ford factory parade spontaneously. But it is in Liège that the most symbolic demonstration takes place. Firefighters douse the courthouse. The message is clear. They want to clean up this justice in which they no longer believe. Let's say that Conrad's withdrawal appeared to be in some way confirmation. 
comme étant, euh, d'une certaine façon, la confirmation... That powerful people were at work and that they wanted to remove Conrad because he was not part of the gang possibly, or because he was too much of an investigator. ...ne faisait pas partie de la bande éventuellement, hein, ou parce qu'il était trop performant en tant que... 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 qu'enquêteur. This accelerates the deep resentment of the population. For everything that is the establishment, the system, as the parents say, what is the establishment, the judicial power, police power, economic power, political power too? All these people are accomplices, somewhere. A week later, on October 20th, over 320,000 people show their desire for justice. This is the White March, the largest popular demonstration in Belgium since the end of the Second World War. It was only supposed to be a small gathering in memory of the children. It is a human tide that is sweeping over Brussels. It's a feeling like a king entering a city. For me, the White March was for the honor of the girls who were murdered. That was for their honor. And for me, it was the first time that I was able to laugh again. A big thank you to everyone for coming in such numbers. Thanks. Thank you also to everyone for coming. Thanks a lot. Little princess, our daughter, our sacred child. We believe that the judicial institution was a means to help us do this. We must have been disillusioned until the day a judge decided to do everything possible, put all his energy, his physical, intellectual and legal means to treat our children's lives. To you, Letitia, Sabine, Julie, Melissa, Anne and Effie, not as usual investigation files, but as sacred files, sacred like your lives, sacred like love, until the day a judge was kind enough to consider you as quenched princesses. From October 20th, the Dutro affair is no longer a news item, it's a state affair. The White March, were you there? Yes, of course. Why are the Belgians demonstrating like this at the time of Judge Conroth's withdrawal? I believe that what strikes all Belgians is the fact that fundamentally, those who had procrastinated, who had circled around Dutrix for 12 long months without taking action, without stopping it, they got out of matters without war, even remarks questions about their role, at least at that time, while the two magistrates who had saved children and had been able to give an answer to the questions that the parents had been posing to the courts and the Belgian police for 14 months, these two suddenly found themselves in the game, at least one of them. Jean-Marc Conrad, simply because of his very good-natured participation in a spaghetti meal. For many people, it seemed completely abnormal that a problem of this type would come to cancel, to erase the extraordinary action that this magistrate had been able to carry out and especially the results that he had been able to obtain, namely the arrest of Marc Dutrix. 
Even if you will agree the idea of going to eat spaghetti was not a good one? Maybe it wasn't the best idea Judge Conroth ever had. And so, certainly, it was possible to seize Jean-Marc Conroth, but it was also possible to consider that it was a completely marginal incident. Almost banal, at least according to the testimonies of certain other magistrates who later dared to say that fundamentally we had perhaps really been looking for the little beast on the skull of Jean-Marc Conroth. Because at the same time, Bourlet says, I will go to the end if they let me. He has his chance and still has a lot of pressure. Yes, the legal world is not new. It is an ultra-hierarchical world in Belgium as elsewhere. And so I think that at the moment when Jean-Marc Conroth is released, the question arises again as to whether this time, the judiciary will overcome this kind of inclination that it has in certain major cases. To let things end in fishtails. The day after the White March, the Belgian government reacted. It created a parliamentary commission of inquiry to shed light on the work of justice, of the police and the gendarmerie. And a big first, finally. Families long ignored by justice are placed at the heart of the debates. The president of this commission invites parents to enter the hemicycle, leave the public benches and say, you are among us, among us the representatives of the people. So, he leaves the benches of the public and the press to come and mingle, enter directly into the committee chamber. There was more than a symbol there, so the politicians in place felt that they absolutely had to be on the side of the parents as well. First of all, I would like to welcome you here to the Palace of the Nation. Know that you are at home here. You must therefore feel completely comfortable and above all completely free. And for the first time, the auditions are broadcast live on Belgian television. For two months, the commission will break all audience records. It's become a sort of passion TV series. We watch that rather than the usual soap operas. We're on reality TV here. When you die, things happen. We see the president of the commission taking a file. Who says I'm taking the file from you and we're going to examine everything in your writings? We insist on a live seizure on television. People experience this in an extraordinarily close way. The phone calls we received, the letters, the arrests in the street. Sometimes, when we were stopped at a red light, people were calling out to you saying they were watching you last night. There are still such questions to ask. Faced with the eight parliamentarians, police officers, gendarmes and magistrates must explain themselves. To justify themselves, all of Belgium hopes to understand why Dutro was not arrested sooner and why Julie, Melissa, Anne and a few were not saved. And the parliamentarians are very harsh on these men and women in charge of the investigation, which clearly did not measure up. I'm disturbed, I admit it to you both, because there is one of you both who is not telling the reality and the truth. And I wonder if this one or that, so I don't express myself, is well aware of what he is doing or what she is doing. Can I speak? You don't have to answer. This is a question that goes into your soul, of the two of you. And I hope that one day we can meet again and look into each other's eyes. In two months, the commission interviewed more than 100 people. But there will be no revelation on possible protections. Public opinion then begins to think that we will never know the truth. In any case, there are too many things we don't know. 
which immediately allows us to revive all the controversies since others can legitimately think that it is because we are hiding them, because we are not looking for them. And others immediately retort that this is legend and that it is simply because we cannot always find and explain everything. Belgium is divided. There are fundamentalists for whom there are networks and protections, and there are those for whom there is none. So it's a bit curious because the fundamentalists say that if we haven't found anything for six years, that's proof that there are protections. And the revisionists say, well listen, when we have such means that we look for six years and we do not find anything, we must put an end to the morbid fantasy and to say that if we cannot find it, it is perhaps because there is nothing to find. I believe that one day we will arrive at a version which will be generally satisfactory. Now to say that we will have the truth, I would say that in any matter, you never have the truth. You have a judicial truth, which you are satisfied with or not. But the truth, ultimately, only Dutruk knows it. And I don't think he'll ever say it. From there, we fear two things. That Dutro doesn't commit suicide or is assassinated. We had overlooked another possibility. Escape. That day, Dutro was taken to the Neuchâtel courthouse to consult his file. It's 3.04 p.m. and suddenly... Madam, sir, good evening. Incredible. The incredible happened this afternoon around 4 p.m. We indeed learned that Marc Dutreau had managed to escape from the Neuchâtel courthouse. Report from this afternoon, Valérie Drey. 3.04 p.m. Marc Dutreau escapes from the Neuchâtel courthouse where he consults his file, as he has for several days. Two gendarmes keep an eye on him. He shoved one of the two, tackle him to the ground, seize his weapon, and escape from the palace. Once outside, he robs a motorist and heads towards Arlen, driving a Renault Megane. We saw two people running, a gendarme behind him, about 10 meters. So in between, they were both running like it was on fire, as you would say. They were walking down the street, and then we heard stop him, stop him. Dutru, the monster believed to be the best guarded prisoner in Belgium, therefore managed to escape. And no one wants to believe that. We always asked ourselves the question, it happened on April 23rd, what if it had happened on April 1st? I don't think anyone could have believed Dutru's escape. It still took a few minutes when the information got out for the services to react, for the editorial staff to take hold of the event. I was here in this office when he escaped. It's one of my friends from the print media who told me. I honestly thought it was a bad taste joke. But since I know my interlocutor, I say to him, you wouldn't be joking, would you? No, I assure you, in the minutes that followed, I understood that it really wasn't a joke because all the press was gathered in these very cramped premises. One of the fears at that time was that while he was on the run, Dutroux is not shot, taking advantage of the situation to silence him. The police immediately called Dutroux's lawyer to tell him something that seemed incredible. The gun he stole is not loaded. Said tirelessly, he certainly has the weapon, but he has no bullets. So, there is no danger on that side, because if he is shot, we will say that it was a scenario fabricated by the gendarmerie, and what else are we going to do? The manhunt is launched across the nation. National and international police services are placed on high alert. But it was finally a forest ranger who spotted him. The Renault Megane having gotten stuck in the mud, the escapee decided to try his luck through the woods near St. Medard in the Chigny Forest. The forest service agent crosses his path and asks him for his identity papers. 
Mark Dutroux flees, but the gender Mary then combs the scene. It's 6.35 p.m. in Stremont, not far from Nucatel, when Mark Dutroux surrendered without resistance. Half an hour later, he was brought back to Neuchâtel, this time at the barracks. Last stop of this day on the run, Arlen Prison. Dutroux's run only lasted three hours and a half. The same evening, the ministers of the interior and justice resigned. An entire country is once again humiliated. Now it's the trial that everyone is waiting for. June 2004. In the box, there is Marc Dutroux, Michel Martin, their accomplices Le Lièvre and Michel Nioul. The debate will last 106 days. And at the end of these 106 days, the jurors decide. There is no network, no conspiracy, no protection, no state affairs. The only culprits were in the dock. Marc Dutroux is sentenced to life imprisonment. Michel Martin gets 30 years in prison, Lilievre gets 25 years. As for Michel Nioul, he was cleared for the kidnappings and sentenced to five years for ecstasy trafficking. <laughs>